everywhere, locally, regionally, nationally. And um, we, we were passionate when we were young, but there just weren't the, that many opportunities. But we started training in our department, we started teaching, we ended up, uh, because of our positions and our passion and, and teaching, we've ended up being instructors for a number of di different disciplines. Uh, I was at the rest of the beginning with the we both started teaching building construction, and you're going to get a lot of building construction emphasis in this class. Uh, in the process of that, we kind of became fans of building code and fire code, so uh, bear with me. It won't be that bad. But we also teach the Officers Academy and teach tactics and strategies, so uh, that's kind of our story. Yeah, and we've taught this, this particular class at Fire Shows West in Reno, Nevada. Um, and we kind of we keep building on it, but one of the things to to tag on what Mike was talking about is really in the last twenty years of the internet era, things have changed a lot in our business where you can really get a lot of experience by watching other departments operate and learn from those and then um, the influence of uh, I, I would assume it 's the internet uh, generation we 've had FDIC for a long, long time but with Brothers in Battle and Nozzle Forward and Irons and Ladders and some of these folks that have really um, perfected the craft at the task level has been awesome to see. I think Mike and I both didn't really know what we didn't know when we were young firemen. It's, I'm just super impressed with the, the younger generation's devotion to being in their lane and being absolutely professional at stretching a line or banging a ladder or something like that. But one of the motivations for teaching this class is, in our area, um, you know, we, we use a lot of the traditional textbooks for our promotional exams, uh, much of which were written you know, in the Northeast, some of the old urban departments. And while we have some old construction, we don't have miles and miles of old uh, building stock that is very predictable. Much like you guys, you have a variety of different buildings in, in your district. So I found myself, as I was coming up and studying, like reading Turpak's book going, do we have that in Boise? Do we have that type building? Oh, I think we have an H type. Okay, we have this or that. But we didn't really have anything that was super specific to the West. And so um, I actually did uh, one of my executive fire officer research papers on this topic, my, my first one, and created a training guide uh, on multifamily dwelling fires. Just because you think about it, you know, you, you jam a bunch of people into an occupancy, you're gonna have a higher life hazard. And we tend to get a lot of apartment fires, so um, we wanted to hone it in a little bit more specifically out of that, zoom out of that northeast area more to any town USA. And that's where it applies to, to Payette and Ontario and everywhere. So we wanted to go away from that kind of that tribal knowledge of from generation to generation and have something out there that we could reference in a, in, in a training guide that acknowledges the newer science and some of that. So that was, that was kind of the motivation for the class. So our objectives, uh, we'll, we'll try to tread lightly, lightly on code, but it, there really is some good tactical implications of the code that we like to review. Um, we'll, we'll do a, a little bit of a dive into building construction review. Um, we do the same thing with all of our folks. Everybody in Proby School gets kind of the brand again, you know, uh, building construction for the fire service. We like to try to bring uh, understanding you have that base level of knowledge, we like to bring some a little bit more tactically useful information to a building construction class that really means something to you on the fire ground when you're in that time compression state. So we're going to identify common benefits and problems with the different types of multifamily dwellings. Uh, we'll introduce you to the categories and then we'll talk about common tactics and assignments. So let's start with uh, what is the fire problem in America today? Uh, last year, um, or 2021 rather, is about 81,000 uh, multifamily dwelling fires resulted in 400 deaths. You guys can read the statistics there. But what I do want to point out is since 1980, we've certainly had a reduction in fires, right? But what might surprise you a little bit is that when we look at our uh, injury rates, um, uh, it's actually up, and uh, I, I don't have that stuff there, but I thought that the deaths are actually up per capita, per fire. And what we attribute that to is the modern fire environment, right? If you think about the old legacy furnishings, and I'm sure you guys have probably seen the NISTUL video of the, the time to flash over with the legacy compartment versus the modern compartment. Well, 
you know, the, with the green movement, we're really trying to, you know, hold our energy in. So you got that increased heat release rate of the fuel package, as well as uh, more energy efficient buildings. And then most everything is some polycarbonate, some type of hydrocarbon derivative, um, like these tables here, you know, which is a, a totally different fuel package than it was in 1975, where it's a, a solid wood table. So I think that's attributed. There's actually a really good article that I've mentioned and, and referenced in my research paper. Um, uh, I, by the way, if anyone wants that specific research paper, I'm happy to get it to you. It's at the, at, you know, the U.S. Fire Academy's archive, but I can certainly get you a copy of it. But this study out of uh, British Columbia talks about today's fire environment being much more hostile, and that's what they're attributing to the increase in um, injuries and deaths per fires. So in our area specifically, um, 429 is just the NIFRS code for the, the multifamily occupancies. Uh, in that time period, uh, we had a handful of fires. This really doesn't necessarily apply here, but um, just talking about our local experience. So this is Mike's first code class. Uh, but if we really look at, at the building codes, um, uh, let's start with, uh, does anyone know the difference between building code and fire code? Anyone, any ideas? So building code regulates the construction of a building when it's new, whereas fire code regulates the use inside that building once it's built, okay? So when we look at our nation's fire experience, this has a drastic impact on what the building code says, okay? Now, a really important thing for you guys to realize that the building that we're gonna train in today, we did a little research, it was built in 1981. So it's gonna tell us a few things. One, it's a modern era building, so we're gonna expect, expect uh, pre-engineered lightweight truss roof assemblies. But it's also uh, doesn't have fire sprinklers in it, built in 1981, right? And the interesting thing about building code versus fire code is building code is not retroactive. And what we mean by that is, um, as the years go on, they don't require you to, every, every three years the fire and building codes are updated. They don't require, just because today, that same building built today would require fire sprinklers in it, they don't go back to the property owner and say, hey, we changed the code and you guys now need to put sprinklers in it. And then three years later, hey, we changed the code and you need to modernize your alarm system. And we changed the code, you can see what would happen if we did that. So building code is not retroactive. And it's the reason all of you guys have older buildings that can present some serious challenges for you that we wouldn't allow that to be built today without the modern fire protection features, but we all have to deal with those, right? Fire code, on the other hand, um, you have, uh, um, if someone wants to change the occupancy use, for example, like we have old warehouses downtown that have been converted to bars. When we changed from a warehouse or a mercantile occupancy into an assembly occupancy, now they have some ability to say, we're not going to give you your permit until you retro fire sprinklers in there because it's an assembly, it's too dangerous. Um, if we look at the history of codes, though, um, uh, really in the late 1800s, um, the fire chiefs, it used to be called the National, um, what was it called, the... National Association of Fire Engineers, that's the IFC today. Um, but they started organizing um, some high level codes, but what you found is different cities had different codes and it, it really wasn't uniform at all. And after the Baltimore, Great Baltimore Fire in 1904, the insurance companies got involved and they said, all right, we're paying out a lot in claims, so we're gonna organize this so that they had uh, regional codes. If we look at the history of codes though, um, and what, they, what you're looking at here is this is uh, Rome burning in 64 AD. And uh, Emperor Nero was the emperor at the time. And you had a whole bunch of wood buildings that they didn't have setbacks. They were built on top of each other. It was very urbanized. So once one fire got going and they had a little bit of a wind event that day, it caused this giant conflagration. And Really shortly, you know, 64 AD is when this fire happened. Shortly after that, Emperor Nero actually created some of the first fire codes. And what we talked about, what they did is when they rebuilt the city, they didn't want wood buildings. So they started requiring masonry type construction. But when we look at, you know, some of your early codes, they started out with what Brannigan calls fire limits. And the goal there is just to limit the fire to the block of origin. 
And that might mean your streets have to be a certain width, or you have to have a certain setback between buildings, or you have a three hour rated firewall between buildings. As the codes became more developed, they started saying, well, let's not just limit it to the block of origin. What about the building of origin? Further development, floor of origin, room of origin. Now we're talking void protection, you know, in recent uh, days. All right. Hey, uh, I just realized we never got you guys' names. Can we just go real quick around the room and get names? Yeah. Oh, cool. All right. Shane Miller, own fan and new Cooper player. Adrian Paz, Bay of Fire. Adrian. Will Hewitt, new captain for Bay of Fire. Cool. Casey, Ontario. All right. Jordan Watts, Ontario. All right. Steve Bath, Weezer. Steve. Ryan Davis, Weezer. Ray Ingalls, New Plymouth. Tyler Tringle, Missile Fire. Okay. Mike Parker, Missile Fire. Randy Fales, Missile. All right, I'm not going to remember all these, but I'm going to try by the end of the day have all you guys' names down. We'll start here Tom. since I know the chief. What Tom is it? Davis. Tom, okay. Matthew, Bush, uh, Bale Fire, and Melba Fire. Cool, all right. William Lanning, Bale Fire. William? Gina? Yeah. Tony? Tony. Jonathan Bear, What is it? Jonathan. Jonathan. All right. And Corey and Steve. What's your last name, Chief? Casanata. Casanata? Yep. Okay, all right, cool. Uh, so we have a. Did Terry Layton retire? Or is he out? Yeah. So we have. Uh, at least one battalion chief. Any other battalion chiefs? All right. Uh, and Tony, you're with Payette also? Okay. How many uh, are you guys uh, on duty full time? Yeah. Okay. Is it, uh, so A, B, C shift? A, B right now. Okay. All right. Uh, captains? All right. Uh, do you guys have rank of a driver or operator? All right. So the rest are firefighters? Lieutenant. We got lieutenant. Oh, lieutenants? Okay, I'm sorry. Yeah, we got rid of those uh, back in the 80s, so. We, we got... <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Yeah, we thought about it. So, uh, we really want the, the class to be interactive. So, if you guys have questions, if you want clarification, whatever, if you have a story to add in or something that you want to add, any, I think I asked, no code experts in here? Awesome. Then I, we can't be called on. Anything. So uh, what we were just talking about, the history there, we're trying to uh, preserve more and more property by um, you know, limiting it to smaller and smaller areas. Well, the ways that we do that, fire protection, the philosophy is we can either do it actively, active fire protection, or passive fire uh, protection. So what's active fire protection? Sprinklers. Sprinklers, yep. Alarm systems would, would fall into that too. Passive is what we've already talked about. Uh, Initially, that was all they had was we're just going to like spread out the distance between buildings. So when one catches on fire, we don't lose a whole gob of them. And those, that, that provision is still in the code today, and you'll notice it. So most multifamily dwellings have qu quite a bit of a setback. Uh, although the developers have worked really hard to limit our egre or access in. So you guys have gone into complexes, right? And, and what do you find? Cars parked everywhere. If there's actually a fire, there's going to be a whole bunch of cop cars in your way, right? So um, it's still there, not always enforced. So we'll go through this active fire protection. Uh, like we said, uh, sprinklers and alarms and detection. Um, oh, I think I brought that piece. Maybe I'll, I'll show it later. Anyway, um, one of the things to know about multifamily dwellings. So, uh, this is regulated or kind of governed uh, by NFPA 13. So it, NFPA 13 prescribes how, uh, if you are mandated by code to have a sprinkler system, it tells you how it has to be done, how it has to be built, where they have to be, th things like that. And there's a, a, uh, a couple subsets of it. There's 13R. 13R, what do you think R stands for? Residence, right? Well, multifamily dwelling counts as a residence. And uh, they made that a little bit uh, of a lower standard because really what they want to do is just get people out of, the, out of the, uh, the building and save lives. It wasn't to protect the property per se. So what does that mean? Well, all the living spaces for the most part will be covered by sprinklers, but not void spaces or really small areas like 
Bathrooms would be excluded oftentimes, closets. Uh, what else am I missing? Four corners. The, the big one for us, though, to think about, and this should be in your head, is uh, it's a multifamily dwelling. It is sprinklered, but the void space isn't, right? So uh, you could think, and we get complacent, right? It's this building sprinklered shouldn't be a problem, even though 12% of the times sprinkler buildings actually catch on fire and burn down when there's a fire inside. Um, so uh, you have to think about that because what if you have an exterior fire that runs up the side, gets in the attic? There's nothing stopping it now, right? So I uh, want to make that point about sprinklers, uh, but that's about all we're going to talk about with sprinklers. Uh, we're going to be mostly talking about passive fire protection. So besides the setbacks uh, or fire protection distances, um, we achieve this by either making the structural members uh, fire resistant, so we can put on, uh, does this have a pointer? Yeah. We can put the spray on stuff. We can wrap it in sheetrock, right? Uh, and the other one that works really well is compartmentation. What does compartmentation do? How does that help us with the fire event itself? It, it, yes, there's two parts to it. It stops the progress of the fire, but it also limits how much oxygen is available. So it's critical. And in, in the previous generations when we grew up, ventilation was before all the NIST and UL studies, uh, man, we opened everything up because we're going to get lift, we want to get all the bad stuff out. What we didn't realize is now we're, introduced, we're taking that compartmentation away and we're allowing all kinds of air in and we're giving the fire exactly what it needs. And you cannot, with our modern fire loads, you cannot ventilate enough to exhaust all of the byproducts of combustion and to limit the spread of it. So you might, one of the tactics we use for ventilation, a traditional method is we're gonna make a hole here to keep the fire, we wanna direct the fire out this hole, right? Well, uh, that hole will get overwhelmed relatively quickly, especially once we've uh, introduced the ability for it to breathe and get air and exhaust. Um, <clears throat> and this does have tactical implications for you guys. We're gonna talk about a number of fire protection features that we think have real um, tactical implications for you. So we'll talk about fire separations, which includes fire walls, fire partitions, fire barriers, fire doors, uh, fire and draft stopping, uh, self-closing doors, that's really that's part of a, of a fire door, but uh, that aspect is critical for us uh, when there's a fire in a building. Egress requirements, we're not gonna talk about that. That's, that does apply though. You guys have a huge stock of old houses built probably, you know, uh, pre-19, uh, well, in Ada County, pre-1980, uh, you find a lot of uh, houses that have really questionable egress uh, ability. Like the windows are really small. You've seen the little eyebrow windows right at ground level. Uh, well, that became, um, that became a, a component of the code, at least in Ada County around uh, the 1980s. Uh, we won't talk about it a lot today though. Sprinklers, alarm systems, I've talked about all I'm gonna talk about with that. Let's talk about fire separations first. So fire separation is designed to limit the, um, the spread of the fire and also smoke. So when they test all of these components that go into a building, all the assemblies, uh, they have to perform to a certain level. And once they have gone through that testing, they say, yes, this assembly will, is rated to three hours. So three hours, it will resist the passage of fire and smoke, but also if it's a structural member, it has to stay structurally sound too. So uh, firewalls are our most bomber separations. Uh, then below that is fire barrier and then fire partition. And we're not, I don't really, you guys don't really need to know all the nuances of it because frankly, the nuances of code are, can be quite complex. And it is really mind numbing uh, to dig into fire and building code. I know because I end up going down rabbit trails all the time and uh, it, is, it is really complex. But there are some basic principles that are good for us to know. So fire partition, that's essentially, uh, around the living space of any dwelling we're in. We've got a partition all the way around this. The 
Uh, ceiling assembly might be a little bit more, not sure. That would depend on a number of factors. But you can kind of count on every living space in a multifamily dwelling. Every apartment's gonna have a one hour separation uh, wrapping that living space to keep it from getting into the next space, all right? So one hour rating. And that require, that's required for walls, floors, and ceilings. Uh, and we, I think a little bit later, I talk about error implications. So uh, we all know that sheetrock performs to a certain level, right? What about uh, a building that was built in the 1930s? What's it going to have? Lath and plaster. Lath and plaster. Do we know what the rating of that is? No. Uh, Even better, right? Uh, could be. <laughs> but... Yeah, I mean, how many of you guys have, I lived in a house that had lath and plaster, and, and what do the walls eventually end up looking like? They got like cracks and stuff, and stuff falls out. It all, it all depends on how well it's stood up over time. So, era is a big issue, and we talk about it in, in context of building construction, but also these code features that are important to us. Because the older the, the fire protection feature that it was installed, the code at the time might have been a little bit lower standard than what it is now, but even if it was bomber, it was a great code provision, and there was a lot of good stuff that was introduced in 1927 when the first one came out. How has it stood up over time? Well, these lath and plaster uh, walls, uh, it depends. It's kind of a crapshoot. They might be. And what happens when they get past it? Well, this is a four-sided, right now it's a three-sided, four-sided wooden uh, chimney, right? So that will burn, and it's rough. Uh, sawn, right? So it will get going pretty quickly. Yeah, and then on, yeah, blocks. exactly. Thank you. Thanks, Adrian. Uh, that's exactly right. We, where are we going to find these? And uh, older wood frame buildings, which are typically balloon frame, and balloon frame has tons of voids. So it's going to go everywhere. Um, Sometimes, has anyone pulled? Uh, Lath and plaster. It sucks. It, yeah, it's a pain. Yeah, this is where everyone loves a trash hook. This is where a pike pole works really well. Um, anyone pulled this stuff? Yeah. Expanded metal with plaster over it? Yeah. So we do have that partition going all the way back to the 1927, uh, but the older it is, the less reliable it would be. Fire barrier. Okay, so a fire barrier is kind of now we're stepping up. It's kind of like a firewall which I might need to explain first, firewall. Does anyone know the, the requirements for a firewall? It has to go from uh, the foundation all the way to the roof deck, and in certain situations, it actually has to go beyond uh, like 18 inches or something like that. But it's, it has a three-hour rating. Fire barrier is kind of like that, except it doesn't have to be, uh, uh, it might be just limiting one little area of a building. So you have a an accessory, I forget what they call it, area, like you've got a boiler room or something. I don't need a firewall separating the building in half, right? I just need to protect that. Where we are concerned about it is the protected stairwell. Uh, that is technically a uh, fire barrier. We're just trying to protect that area of egress. And this will become, uh, the point of this will become more obvious as we talk about center hall occupancies, if it isn't already. But that is critical to have a area that is not going to get fire into it uh, for three hours. These are usually two to three hour barriers. Uh, the protected stairwell, like I said, critical to us, especially center halls. This is one of the best things that ever was added to the uh, building code. And this does have tactical implications for us. Uh, anyone want to take a stab? Why is it so important to have the protected stairwell? It is. So I have a fire on the first floor. What does it mean if I don't have a protected stairwell for people on two and three? Gonna yeah, yeah. They're, you're going to have a lot of, lot of dead people, probably, uh, or people jumping out of windows. This was a fire we had uh, back in August, August-ish. Uh, built in 1980, so I would have per expected a protected stairwell, but um, it was only two stories, so I think it uh, got a pass on that. And what happened? Fire on the first floor, uh, went through the door and went up, filled this hallway, 
This hallway was black, uh, thick smoke from ceiling to floor. And um, it created quite a bit of problems for us uh, on our, our search. Uh, you can see, here's one being built. You can see how it's uh, really bomber. They, they've made it so it's fire resistive. And this is, you know, this is kind of what you typically have. And you'll have a fire door with it, fire separation, um, self-closing doors. What we're trying to do with a firewall is we're essentially, we want to build a build, big building, right? But the problem with a big building, especially with certain type of occupancies, if you have a lot of people in it, it's hard to get them out, right? So you can either put in a whole bunch of exits, or maybe we can just separate this thing into a larger, into separate uh, occupancies, and so, or fire areas is what they call it. So we're essentially, because we have this uh, firewall here, we're essentially considering this like a second building. That's, it's like a different building because we're so confident in that firewall. And as long as that firewall uh, holds up, uh, we'll be fine. And then people can exit from here to here instead of having to get, if the only exit is all the way over there, they don't have to go all that way with fire looking at their heels. Uh, here's a few examples. You also see in between actual uh, residences. So uh, do we talk about um, residential code versus building code later? Okay, yeah, I won't talk about it here, but um, this is, um, these are, owner-occupied uh, separate residences. So they own from that wall all the way to the ground out to the street. They own that patch of grass over that wall. They own the whole thing. So these aren't apartments that you rent out. They actually own it. And you'll, you can see on you guys' uh, MDT, so you have a map that can show uh, plot lines, show the parcels? No. You don't? Okay. Do you have any mapping? Uh, Apps, uh, a lot of our guys end up using apps on their phone for mapping. Like Onyx. Onyx? Onyx. Onyx is good because it actually shows parcel lines. Mm -hmm. And that will, that will become important. We'll talk about that when we get to row homes. Keep that in your mind, why parcel lines are important, because it can tell you a little bit more about what is actually going on with that building. Uh, this is just a big center hall building. You can see the bomber thing here. Um, and this will segue into our next thing. but. Uh, imagine uh, I live here, but my best friend lives down here. That firewall has separated this into two buildings, right? Well, I don't want to have to walk all the way around, so what do they put in the middle of that in the hallway that I can go through? A door, right? A fire door, right? So um, I'm getting a little ahead of myself on that. Remember what I said about the era is important? So firewalls go way back, back into the historic era. This is one that was uh, at one of our places downtown. That, uh, built at the time, uh, was intended to be a uh, firewall because it was two separate occupancies. Uh, but if you look at it, look, there's a conduit that's, uh, I don't know if I have a picture there, but you can see I, when I was walking around, it punches through and it's not fire caulked. So there's a gap there. There's gaps probably in a lot of the, the um, mortar um, and anything they've done along the way, I don't know, this probably goes through at some point. So as, it, as a building gets older, the reliance on those fire protection features get uh, less and less reliable. All right, so we need to get from one fire area to another. We have to go through a fire door. So uh, this, and you'll see these in really big, uh, occupancies, typically they're going to be multifamily dwellings. So this is one um, down by BSU. It's huge. It's absolutely massive. And you've got exits, a few exits here and there, but they put these firewalls in so that they don't, one, lose the entire building, two, stop the smoke from migrating from this section into that section into that section. Um, <clears throat> in conjunction with every fire wall, you're going to have a fire door. So if you see a fire door, that tells you there's probably a fire wall right there that's separated into two separate places. So you can probably count on 
Uh, we punched the ceiling here. We got fire here. Probably shouldn't be able to punch the ceiling over here and see fire over here because it has to go all the way through, remember, from foundation to roof deck. Uh, this is from when Chief Hummel went to uh, London. They actually placard the doors and have pretty good compliance too, right? It's impressive, yeah. Yeah. What do we, I don't know if you guys see it. I see it all the time. Fire doors being propped open. And, and I'm not talking propped open like they're supposed, like uh, they're intended to be. Like this one's set so when the alarm goes off, it automatically releases, right? But you've got other ones in older buildings where they just prop it open with a wedge and that's not going to close when there's a fire. So a firewall, is that considered solid concrete from top to bottom, or can it be like double sheeted, double yeah, uh, it, sheet rock? Yeah, you look at this. So this is double sheeted, and it's double sheeted on both sides of this wall, and then they actually have to build another uh, wall for the structure itself to, to hold the load of the second floor. So, <laughs> yeah. Like some of the Boise houses near... Uh, Micron, they had to do double street rock on the soffits, five-eighths rock. Yeah. Uh, I was... Sucks. Yeah, did you work on those? I did. Is it the Elevation ones on... Uh... Elevation Ridge. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You can literally jump from one house to the other. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, the, the setbacks, it's crazy. The setbacks are like uh, a couple feet. A couple feet. It's, it's crazy. But they, yeah, so they had to sheet rock the, the uh, soffits, right? Yep. And there's, I don't believe there's soffit vents there either. Nope. No, but which is good, uh, but it still makes me a little bit uneasy that we have houses that close to each other. And they have limitations of how many windows you can have exposing each side, right? Yes. Uh, yeah, but we'll see. Uh, I guess the test will be when one catches on fire. Yeah. At least they got a station, right? There in the next block. Yeah, although uh, you remember like on Alpha on the front side is grade level and then it drops off. Uh, two, two floors below, there's two sub-levels, and it is treacherous to get to the back side. So if you're thinking about coming in from the, which I would come in from the basement if I could, but it, you're probably going to, someone's going to break a leg or an ankle probably. Uh, fire doors, these are really critical for us uh, tactically, and we should be paying attention to these. We ha have a habit of doing what when we go through a door? Opening it and chalking it, right? Well, we, we need to be mindful of that uh, in these situations because that fire door could be our best friend if we have a big occupancy like this on fire. And I, I talk about this a little bit later, but there's when at a, whenever possible, avoid going through a fire door if you can because it is helping you out. It's stopping the spread of smoke and fire, limiting oxygen. <clears throat> um, and it also gives you time, so if I've got a fire here, I can evacuate people out of here pretty quickly. Well, relatively. A lot quicker than if there was a whole bunch of smoke in this hallway, right? So when you can, keep the fire door closed. Uh, this is what it looks like. Was this one of ours? Uh, but you can see how well these, these work. So this is the fire side, utter destruction, this side is pretty clean. We have a little bit of soot stain, right? Uh, now, you'll notice the term assembly. What, if I say fire door assembly, what is that? Does that mean anything to any of you guys? The whole kit? Yes, including... Frame, handles, everything? Yes, the door itself, the frame, jam, door stop, the seals. The magnet included in that? Yep, yeah, because... Uh, especially if it's going to be one where it's a hallway we intend people to walk through all the time. We don't want them to have to open it. We expect that magnet to work properly. So the whole assembly has to work, uh, including the latch. And also, uh, code, I think, prescribes an eight, one-eighth inch gap at the bottom because we want to stop smoke, too. That's important because... Um, modification can change that. Our own actions can do that. So if I'm going through and I have a whole bunch of, let's see, I think, I'll just talk about this right now too. All these doors here in this occupancy are fire rated doors. They're not going to be, now the fire door that's in conjunction with the fire wall has to meet the same rating. It has to have a three hour rating. These ones 
uh, to the rooms. Um, it's a one hour partition, but they're allowed to go down to a 20 minute um, rating. But that still works pretty good if the whole assembly is working. The big part of that is a self-closing hinge. Um, but what happens over time to, to these spring-loaded hinges? Spring they stop. Yeah. What happens if we had hardwood floors in here and then we throw carpet in? Changes how the door closes. Exactly. And that's what happened, you guys familiar with the line of duty death, Dowling Circle in Maryland? Yeah. Uh, they had a fire in a multifamily dwelling, fire on the first floor, an enclosed alcove. Uh, uh, two guys go up to the top floor. One goes in one apartment, the door closes behind him. The other one goes in the other one. Door doesn't close behind him. Why? Because they had remodeled, put carpet in, and to get that door closed, you had to actively close it. So they, oh, they defeated one of the functions of that assembly, which was the self-closing hinge. Very critical. Um, another thing that can happen too, though, let's say it was carpet, now we want hardwood floors. Now we take the carpet out, now we've got a big old gap. And that's exactly what happened to us on that fire I showed you with the not protected stairwell. They had like inch and a half gap. Oh, yeah, right here. Oh. <clears throat> this is what we had. They took carpet out. So what did we find? I, that hallway was, was charged with smoke, top to bottom, and what was in the rooms? smoke. And I've gotten varying reports uh, from our folks that were there. I should have been there, but I got called to uh, a nothing call the other direction right when this came in. Um, they said, some, some of our folks said, uh, yeah, the rooms were just totally charged with smoke. I said, yeah, it was, there was some smoke. But I guarantee you, uh, even with that, the rest of the assembly was in place, which did a lot. I'm guessing conditions inside the apartment were probably a lot better than the hallway, right? But we are creatures of habit, and what do we always do? We're doing a search, so what do we do? We have to open every door. When I force this door and that handle, get in there like, oh, uh, you're in here. Okay, just stay put. Close the door. They close the door. Is it still a fire rated assembly? Depends on how well you, you forced it. I mean, but typically when we force the door, we just, we totally destroy the, the jam and the, and the latching, right? So now that rated assembly is no longer rated assembly, and now it will get bad in there. That's something to keep in mind. Do I need to force this door or not? What's this door doing? And that is really important in a center hallway, multifamily dwelling. Um, this is an example too, Twin Parks Northwest Complex. You guys remember this uh, last year? 13, 17 people died. Seven people died. 17 people died. Fire on the third floor. Occupant runs out with his daughter. Uh, self closing door doesn't close because this is an old building um, or for whatever. There's going to be a lot of reasons it doesn't close. Uh, he gets out, but smoke fills the hallway. The protected stairwell. Uh, that door was open too, and it went all the way up, and the door on the 16th floor, 17th, 15th floor, it also didn't close. So it filled up that floor, and that's where a lot of the fatalities happened. We, when we're going to uh, a high rise, one of the things we uh, train our guys to do is check doors as you're going. We want to make sure that they are latching and shutting, because you also, on top of this, um, you have stack effect, which is either going to try and encourage the door to open or close, depending on where you're at in the building and what time of year it is and temperature and stuff like that. Um, draft stopping is the other um, fire protection feature that we want to talk about, and I believe this is yours, Aaron, to talk about. So on the uh, self-closing doors, um, just recognizing, especially in your multifamily dwelling, in the multifamily dwelling, just recognizing that um, that's part of the assembly, especially in that center hallway environment. People install door latches or a, a little door stop, 
rather. In fact, our city housing folks, you know, they had requests that like, hey, it's really inconvenient to have that self-closing door when I'm taking groceries in. So our city housing folks were installing little door stops on these rated fire doors. So we would have doors open uh, to the hall corridors and some of the- I did that on my garage door. <laughs> yeah. I know the risk though. And, uh, I don't know. Hopefully it doesn't come back. I have a picture in another class where we found someone, it was in Imperial Plaza. They used a coat hanger to, to open the self-closing uh, stair tower. It was the evacuation tower, you know, and they had it, you know, propped open with a coat hanger. So uh, just stuff like that, but recognizing what you're looking at when you're on medical calls and, and doing your thing. So real quick, just on the draft stopping, that this is uh, intended, the, the code uh, talks about, um, they're just trying to limit the, uh, the, the lumber yard or the unoccupied space. 3,000 square feet or every, uh, no greater than over every two apartment units. So uh, the builders are gonna do what's the least expensive, most efficient. Another thing to keep in mind is there's a bunch of trade-offs that you can do with the code. So Mike mentioned earlier in the 13R system, you uh, won't have sprinklers in the attic. Well, that's not always true because of trade-offs. If it's more expensive to have to do draft stopping than put a sprinkler system in, then they'll do the sprinkler system. In most cases, it's cheaper to do the draft stopping. So they'll do the draft stopping every 3,000 square feet. Any ideas why that's there? Well, any, any ideas why, that, why we would have a draft stopping in the attic, for example? Yeah, it limits the fire spread. But as the name implies, it also limits the draft. Right, so less air to be able to go in there. And for the ICs in the room, um, the bat chief, the chief, um, there's some things that I'm gonna point out here that um, can be important and, and really important when it comes to, depending on what your staffing looks like. If you can throw six or seven engines at something, it's not quite as painful as if you have two engines, right? And you really need to be strategic about where you place that second engine, for example. So some things to think about. Uh, this was a, a row home style fire. We'll talk about row homes later. But what I wanted to point out here is um, this is the draft stopping uh, in the attic uh, between the different occupancies, which happen to be here. Uh, and when you look at this, so uh, there's, who else done construction here? I forgot to ask that. Handful. Yeah, so like residential, commercial. Anyone do commercial construction? all residential framing, stuff like that. So our background, Mike was a framer in the 80s. I worked a little bit of commercial uh, construction before I went in the military. So limited you know, experience. We've kind of nerded out on building construction just because, uh, well, honestly, I got into it because all the you know senior members back in the day talked about how important understanding building construction was. And I just didn't feel like I had a good enough grasp, so I started teaching it. But what I wanted to point out here is these eyebrow vents that we have, you know, you have a soffit vent down on the bottom, an eyebrow vent at the peak, allows that good normal stack effect, allows for energy efficiency. Um, well, if we pay attention to what our eyebrow vents are telling us, it tells us because you don't have a front side, back side eyebrow vent, it tells us that our draft stopping is running transverse to the building, which is exactly what we found out here on this. So, um, this particular building, it's not uh, as unforgiving as maybe, you know, your alcove style or your breezeway style and trying to predict where the draft stopping is. So this is a different fire that um, I was the BC, Mike was the first to engine on this. Um, second floor, uh, it's a breezeway style apartment building, but second floor fire, uh, it comes out in the balcony, extends to the third floor, gets in the third floor and then gets in the attic. This is the draft stop that's above the third floor apartments in the attic. And if we compare the difference between this dra these eyebrow vents versus these, these are all on one side of the peak, which tells us transverse draft stopping. These are on both sides of the peak, which notice I did a little line here, which means we have front side, back side, uh, we have draft stopping running longitudinally. Why is that important? Well, um, in this case, so your fire apartment is, uh, say, here and extending to three. This apartment is threatened. This apartment's on fire. 
So once it gets in the attic, which it went up in the soffit vents, so we knew it was in the attic. Which one's most threatened, this backside apartment or this one? Right, the one that doesn't have the draft stopping separation, because remember, 3,000 square feet are every two apartments. So it's gonna go from this attic directly to this attic and make your fire bigger, right? So if I only have two engines, if I, I always ran Google Earth in the background on my bat rig so that I could see middle of the night, you can kind of see what, the, what it looks like as far as exposure, setbacks, stuff like that. Um, you can, if you know what you're looking for, you can look and you can see, oh, my draft stopping's running this direction. I'm putting my second end engine to check for extension in this apartment before the, that apartment, right? Maybe my third engine's gonna buy me a little bit of time because you have that separation in the attic. It might be the difference between hey, we just had a little extension of the attic, we were able to knock it down versus it really gets ahead of us because we put our second new engine here and it was 20 minutes before we got our third new engine to be able to you know, check extension there. And it gets away from us, right? Now we burn the roof off it, we lose the whole building. Not super critical, but it's something just to be aware of. So we like to, to point it out. Do you guys conceptually understand why, how that tells us that got that eyebrow bent on one side of the peak, why that tells us that it's going this way versus I got on this side and this side. I've got an eyebrow vent here and two feet away I've got one here. Why would I need two vents right next to them? Yeah, it's just yeah. there's, there, there's a, something separating those two. Yeah, thanks. How long does that vent in the cold? The eyebrow vents or the yeah. draft something? The, the first the, version. The draft has been in for quite a while. But, um, that's a good question. I'm not really sure on that. You know, the first draft stopping iteration was in the first uniform building code, which covered all of us in the West in 27. But what we teach in our training guide and with our class, just from building observations and, and really paying attention after fires, like where guys pulled the ceiling, hey, let's go see if there's draft stoppers. What we found was it really wasn't terribly reliable, even though the code started in 27, until about the night, early 1970s. If, it's, if the building's newer than 1970, we generally see draft stopping. If it's older than that, well, we don't. But as far as the, the, I'm not really sure on that. Because that's the first time I've realized it. I've yeah. seen it. Yeah. Nobody taught us this, to be perfectly honest. This is just from really being perceptive after fires and teaching building construction and nerding out on the code a little bit. What we had in our department is we had the prevention guys and we had the ops guys. We didn't do a lot of talking. And, they, and not that they didn't get along, but it, there really wasn't a lot of crossover. Mike and I were kind of the first generation that started going, well, wait a minute, we're awful ignorant in operations. We think we're all great putting these fires out, but the truth is, if it weren't for the building code features that limited areas, we're not near as great as we thought we were. And so we started looking at, well, what's tactically useful in the code? And so that's where we started paying attention to some of that stuff. Uh, one of the things to, to know about, note about these two, uh, this is sheetrock, but uh, I want sheetrock too. Yeah. But it doesn't have to be sheetrock. It, it can be OSB. And it doesn't have to be uh, super tight. Oftentimes it's not super tight. That's why you see, so you have a fire burner here. We know fire creates pressure. And so um, you will see that pe pressure pushing through any opening possible. So pressure, small opening is going to be more forceful, right? And you, I, I wish I could find the picture. I got a picture of uh, one where there's a streak about three feet long of like a, where a jet of fire went through that firewall. So they work really well at slowing the fire, but they, I mean, you got to check the other side of it. Yeah, it's just a lower priority. For those of you that, that are qualified to, to pump, you know, we talk about the relationship, the inverse relationship between pressure and volume, right? There's a lot more velocity of that inch three quarter than there is in the five inch, right? When I was a young fireman and someone's like, oh, look at that little gap in the, in the firewall or whatever. I'm like, it's just a little gap. It's not that big a deal. Well, what we learned in pictures like that is it may be a small opening, but it's like a flamethrower because of that inverse relationship between pressure and volume. Fire is a pressure event. If you listen to the radio traffic on that last picture, you hear me have the uh, first truck vertically ventilate, and I tell him, let's see if you can ventilate over the fire apartment and take the pressure off the draft stopping. When sure enough, we go take that post-fire picture and you can see the evidence, there was quite a bit of pressure that was pushing through those seams, wanting to extend. Um, so, 
we talked about how era makes a difference, right? Because the older it is, there's two, two factors there. One, maybe it wasn't in the code at the time, right? And code's not retroactive. So even though the building was built in 1940 and we had a new standard uh, in 1960, that building stays the way it is. Uh, even if it was installed, whatever it was, whatever fire protection feature we're talking about, if it's uh, draft stopping or protected stairwell, whatever, remember it degrades over time. So how reliable it is, it, is it? There's another factor here that's really important, and this is why I really encourage people to know their jurisdictions. And uh, that is, so 1927, UBC comes out, and it has all these requirements for how a building's supposed to be built for uh, fire safety and whatnot, right? Well, that's a model code, which means your jurisdiction doesn't have to follow it. It has to adopt it. Your local jurisdiction has to adopt it. And they can exempt things out. Here in Idaho, we adopt the code, and there's always exemptions that are pulled out uh, from the latest version. Uh, so you may not, it may not have been actually adopted in your, your area, uh, even though we know that this, this thing, draft stopping's been around since, uh, was it 1920, in, in the first UBC? Yeah, it was in the, the 1927 UBC, but Ontario may not have uh, adopted that code, NISA. Um, and furthermore, um, here's an example. So. This is the city in 1964, city of Boise. This was my district. Sorry. Oh, that's all right. We were looking at an apartment over in this and just kind of trying, I got it on Google Maps, just trying to look at it to see how it was set up versus what you guys were talking about. So oh, I would. The bridge cap vent versus the eyebrow vent. Oh. So it's a little bit more difficult to tell, but I'll think through that a little bit. Yeah. And we'll take a break and probably, you know, on the eyebrow. Yeah, I wonder if we could pull that up somehow. Yeah, but sure. anyway. Um, so in 1964, this was the city limits of Boise. This, this was my district for about six years, Engine 9. And this was developed heavily in the 1940s through 60s. So everything being built there felt under whatever code was being adopted. And this was um, the Cole Collister Fire Department at the time. Whatever they had adopted, that's what they fell under. But Cole Collister was a rural, um, pretty small department. They had, uh, they might have been a combination, but my guess is they probably didn't have a lot of staff in their prevention bureau, right? So how good was the enforcement of that code? And this is a rural area, area and the code enforcement guy might be my fishing buddy. So, uh, the code is only as good as adoption and then the enforcement. So if you are going to an area that was, uh, you guys respond probably into unincorporated areas of the county, right? So that's a total crapshoot too. You don't know what you're gonna get. And especially if it's older, even if it's been annexed into the city. I was, this is, was annexed in, my district was in, uh, I don't know, the 70s. Uh, it still had all that code enforcement and from the 1940s, 50s, and 60s. So you need to pay attention to that. Think about that. Uh, know your district. I know. I knew when I went into various types of uh, occupancies here, and I really thought about the commercial ones, but also residential, that it, it was a crapshoot I was going to get. And it, it, it is. This district is a treasure trove. It's fascinating. Like all kinds of different types of buildings. And you go into a residence and, you know, there's standards for what the stair tread height right, uh, rise and run has to be. I mean, there's like stairs that you practically climb like a ladder. They're super narrow. There's, uh, you go into a room, there's no secondary egress, no window to get out of. You're, you're just trapped. It's, it's, a, it's wild west. Um, okay, now we're going to get into, you want to take a break? This is probably a good time for a break. So let's take... 10.